This is Rick Rule for Rule Investment Media, sponsors of the 2024 Natural Resources Investment Symposium held July 7 through 11 in Boca Raton, Florida. Whether you attend live in Boca Raton or whether you attend from the comfort and convenience of your own home by a live stream, please understand that we're going to deliver you between 50 and 60 hours of intense programming more than you can absorb in the four days of the conference. To that end, the conference will be recorded. You can uh, listen to it again and again and again, which you must to get the benefit out of, out of it. Uh, note too, that as a consequence of the limited amount of time that we have on offer, we're interviewing every exhibitor and every speaker before the conference so that you can allocate your time both before and during the conference to follow up on topics that are interested, interesting for you and allocate opportunities, allocate capital, pardon me, to the opportunities available to you. Note too, that every public company exhibitor at the conference has been vetted by me personally, which is to say that I own stock or accounts that I manage own stock in every single one of the exhibitors. While this is indeed a conflict of interest, one that I'm proud of, it's your guarantee that every public company has been vetted prior to being admitted to the conference. As part of this interview process, today I'm delighted to interview a friend of mine of very long standing, uh, Rudy Frank of Seabridge Gold. I've known Rudy for the better part of two decades, and he's been an ongoing supporter of our educational efforts during that entire time. Rudy, thank you for your efforts on behalf of shareholders, myself included. Thank you too for your ongoing support of the educational activities of the Natural Resource Investment Symposiums. Rick, always a pleasure to get on the screen with you and thank you for the opportunity. Let's get right into it. Uh, tell me something about the history of Seabridge. You have been involved in this company for a very long time. Uh, and I think it's fair to say it started life as a gold optionality play. So tell me something about the genesis of Seabridge, the early history of Seabridge, how you came to acquire these assets, uh, <laughs> Tell us about the pittance that you paid for them <laughs> and, and how you're beneficiating those assets now. Uh, sure, Rick. So uh, my, my partners and I saw an opportunity back in 1999 when gold was trading at about 260 an ounce. We believe for different reasons that the price of gold would go substantially higher. And our goal was quite simple. Within a public company, uh, Shell we took control of, uh, build the best optionality and leverage the gold price. And we've done that through the simple concept of growing ounces in the ground faster than shares outstanding. The more gold you can provide your shareholders on a per share basis, the better your share price you do as the gold price goes higher. So in the beginning, uh, we were buying uneconomic deposits. You can think of us as an unexpiring out of the money call option on gold. And as time gone on now through higher metal prices and also expiration success we've had at our various projects, we are now not only an unexpiring call option gold, gold, but we're also deep in the money. So uh, just to quantify this, uh, tell us from the most re recent documents, uh, what sort of uh, MI and I measured, indicated and inferred reserve and resource you have in Seabridge and juxtapose that to the market cap. Okay, uh, it, it, it's remarkable. We, we have 180 million ounces of gold in the ground in all resources categories. On top of that, we have 58 billion pounds of copper. We have over 900 million ounces of silver, and we have over 1 billion pounds of molybdenum. If you take all that metal together at today's metal prices and calculate the in-situ per share value, it's over $6,000 of metal in the ground per share. And today we're trading at about $15 per share. Uh, that is certainly uh, optionality on steroids. Uh, remind us too, uh, how much you paid for the original KSM deposit, uh, and then how much you paid for the deposit across the line from Silver Standard. Uh, in other words, uh, how much money did you spend to create this value? Yeah, so uh, originally uh, when we purchased KSM from Plaster Dome in uh, the year 2000, we paid $200,000 to buy KSM. Uh, Plaster Dome had spent over $25 million previously on that asset. Uh, as we advanced the project, it became clear to us there was another piece of the puzzle missing. Our next door neighbor owned a project called or a deposit called uh, Snowfield. Uh, we purchased that from Predium 
in late 2020 for $100 million US in cash. So um, those are the two big purchases we did associated with KSM. So you've owned these <laughs> you've owned these assets for two decades. I joke that uh, Rudy, you like me, worked two decades to become an overnight uh, become an overnight success. Uh, and you were correct in your thesis in the sense that the gold price advanced from two hundred and forty bucks an ounce to twenty four hundred bucks an ounce. Uh, the time has come to begin the process of beneficiating that. So tell us something about the progress that you've made in the last three or four years, uh, finally bringing these deposits forward. Yeah, so we recognize that an ounce of gold in your pocket is worth more than an ounce of gold sitting in the ground in Northern British Columbia. So, so now the, uh, the, the, the pivot for the company now is to how do we get those ounces out of the ground into the pockets of our shareholders? So uh, we are now running a joint venture process. I should say RBC Capital Markets is running it for us. We are now engaged with some of the largest gold mining companies and copper mining companies on the planet to bring forward a production decision at KSM. Uh, KSM is pretty unique, and not only is it large, it's situated in a very safe jurisdiction, but it's one of the few projects in the world of, of size that actually has gone through the environmental approval process with permits in hand. And in addition to that, the company has been spending a fair bit of its own money uh, on pre-works. Could you tell us something about the advancement of the physical infrastructure that you've been responsible for? And while you're at it, uh, Talk to our audience something about the relationship that you enjoy with the tall town and the Nishka, which I think is an important asset off the balance sheet. Yeah, so the tall town and the Nishka are the two key First Nations in close proximity to the project. Uh, my experience in British Columbia is you can get projects approved if and only if you have the support of the local indigenous groups surrounding you. So we work very hard at that. We have an impact benefit in, in place with uh, impact impact benefit agreement in place with the Nishka Nation and the tall town Nation. In fact, they have now formed a joint venture together, and a lot of the early site construction that we've done at the project is uh, dedicated towards uh, to their capabilities uh, and their joint venture. Yeah, so K KSM got its environmental approvals in 2014. They were set to expire in 2024. You have a two-year, a ten-year period until expiry. Uh, with COVID, we got a two-year extension to 2026. Uh, fortunately, in British Columbia, there's a concept known as substantially started that if you can achieve that designation, your permits are then good for the life of the project. So about two and a half years ago, we went out and decided to do this work ourselves, building roads, building camps, uh, building bridges, uh, tying into the power grid with BC Hydro, uh, uh, and also building fish compensation areas. We've now spent over $400 million Canadian, specifically on early site construction, dedicated towards substantially started activities. And in January of this year, we put in the formal application for that designation with strong letters of support from the local communities and the indigenous nations around us. Uh, if you feel comfortable quoting publicly available documents, uh, what can you say about the net present value of these deposits? Third party established net present value of these deposits at current commodity prices. Uh, I think this is part of the story around Seabridge that people are missing. Yeah. So if you use today's metal prices, we actually have a slide deck that runs the projects at $2,200 gold and $4 copper. And I might point out that uh, both metal prices are above that. Uh, we're looking at a uh, an IRR north of 20%, uh, well above 20%. We're looking at an NPV uh, approaching $13 billion. Our market cap today is about 1.3 billion. Thanks for doing the arithmetic for people. Uh, it, it helps to hear it from the horse's mouth. Uh, uh, ultimately, I, I guess the catalyst here will be uh, a super major mining company coming in and being becoming a joint venture uh, partner of yours. One can never tell the timing with regards to that. So tell us something about the ongoing process of de-risking the project and increasing uh, people's knowledge of the project, uh, what sort of catalysts that you see in the next 12 to 18 months from work that you're doing today? Yeah. Well, probably the most important one, Rick, is substantially started designation. I mean, that is obviously a risk associated with the project today. If we don't get that designation, we have to, uh, we have to start the environmental assess assessment process all over again. Nobody wants that, which is why we work so hard on it. Our expectation on substantially start is we get that designation this year, which will then facilitate to get a joint venture done.
Uh, so that's something we've been working very diligently on. It's important for our listeners to understand that this $400 million expenditure that you're incurring uh, would have had to have been incurred by a joint venture partner at any rate. Uh, in other words, this is money down a rat hole. This is a necessary part of the pre-construction of any major deposit worldwide uh, and could be expected in one way, shape or form to be recouped in a joint venture agreement. Is that correct? 100%. Yes. I mean, these, uh, you know, we're focusing on getting site access through roads, bringing cheap power. We're fortunate we have BC Hydro that can furnish all the uh, the hydropower for this project right next door to uh, the highway that services our project. So uh, this, this is a very, very important element, but it's also something that uh, moves the project forward in terms of uh, to first production. Uh, a deposit of this magnitude, which is to say 180 million ounce gold occurrence, uh, is a true freak of nature. Uh, extremely rare. One of the knocks against the project has always been the grade of the project relative to the upfront capital costs. What has struck me for 20 years is a mineral endowment this size, when it comes into contact with correct ground prep preparation, uh, yields high-grade pockets, uh, not unlike the Pretium deposit. Could you tell me something about what you see as the prospectivity for making the deposit larger and finding higher grade starters and what you're doing in that regard? Well, the most recent pre-fees we did focused on the higher grade gold areas, namely uh, Mitchell, East Mitchell and Sulphurettes. And on that pre-fees, we can show a 33 year mine life, averaging over 1 million ounces of gold production a year, averaging about 178 million pounds of copper a year a project that, including the upfront capital of 6.4 billion, including the sustaining capital over the 33 years, including the closure costs, including the reclamation costs, and including the operating costs, net of copper and silver credits, you have an all-in cost of production, a true all-in cost of production of about $500 an ounce at today's metal prices. So uh, we don't need to find high grade, Rick. This project also sings uh, in terms of what's there today, in terms of, uh, you know, another thing to look at is capital recoupment. We show an initial 33 year mine life. We can then add on another 39 years, focusing on two deposits that are not even included in the pre fees. So it's 72 years of mine life. Payback of the initial capital, the 6.4 billion at today's metal prices, happens in less than three years. Yeah, it's important when you look at these great big deposits to understand that if you do an NPV calculation, at the end of the NPV period, you restart the clock. <laughs> you, you, you do it all over again. Uh, Rudy, to the extent that uh, our attendees would like to learn more uh, about Seabridge, to the extent that they believe that today's gold or silver prices will hold or go higher, who do they contact and how do they reach that person? Well, not only am I the chairman and CEO, I'm also head of investor relations. So I am the point of contact. I've been the point of contact for 25 years. And quite honestly, that's one of the most enjoyable parts of my job where I get to interact not only with large uh, you know, fund managers, but also with people that are putting their own money into the, into the name and want to meet and talk to the CEO. And I'm always available and willing to do so. The best answer from a CEO as to the company contact is always <laughs> the CEO. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you, too, for two decades of toil on behalf of shareholders, especially this one. Uh, and thank you, too, for your ongoing support of the educational activities around the Natural Resources Investment Symposium. Rick, uh, always fun to get on the, on the phone with you or on a screen, and I really look forward to spending some time with you down in Florida. We will have fun, I guarantee it.